This is an overview of calcium and phosphorus metabolism. I would recommend watching this once the entire way through, and then going back to my other videos on calcitriol and on forms of calcium and phosphorus in the body. Then come back to this video to ensure complete understanding of all the topics that I cover. You should also connect what you learn here with what you are learning about bone metabolism and shown in the video on bone remodeling. Calcium and phosphorus metabolism integrates four separate systems. The gastrointestinal system, the endocrine system, marked by parathyroid hormone and vitamin D, the renal system, where vitamin D is activated and where calcium and phosphorus are both filtered and reabsorbed, and the musculoskeletal system, with bone resorption and formation. A brief word about parathyroid hormone, or PTH. The calcium-sensing receptors in the parathyroid sense changes in ionized calcium and subsequently vary its release of PTH which acts to increase the plasma calcium in three ways, detailed in this video. Decreases in calcium will stimulate production and release of PTH, whereas increases in calcium will suppress production and release of PTH. One way calcium enters the body is via oral intake, followed by absorption. Some of this is lost in the feces. Bones are in a constant balance between formation and resorption, called bone turnover. Further details on this can be seen in the video on bone turnover. An amazing amount of calcium and phosphorus is continually freely filtered in the kidney. Some of this is reabsorbed both freely and under hormonal control, and the remainder is excreted in urine. The endocrine system uses hormones to regulate all the processes just described and pictured here, in order to maintain physiologic levels of calcium and phosphorus in the serum. So, for normal calcium balance, in an individual who has normal bone turnover and normal renal function, whatever calcium that is taken in by mouth must be the same that is excreted in feces and urine. I only depict the stomach here, but calcium and phosphorus are absorbed throughout the gastrointestinal tract into the blood under the stimulation of activated vitamin D known as calcitriol, which, remember from the reading and from the other video, exists in its activated form after acquiring vitamin D from the diet or from the sun, and then activated by 25-hydroxylase in the liver, and finally activated by 1-alpha-hydroxylase, which is mainly in the kidney, and is stimulated in the presence of PTH. While in the intestine, calcium can combine with anions, such as phosphate and oxalate, to form insoluble salts that are not absorbable and are subsequently excreted in the feces. Recall from other videos that most of the body's calcium and phosphate exist in bone as hydroxyapatite. Think of the bone, then, as a reservoir to maintain a normal plasma calcium concentration. Recall the function of osteoblasts, which utilize calcium and phosphorus to build bone in the process called formation, and osteoclasts, the cells of resorption, which destroy bone and create calcium. I purposely stress the B in blasts and the C in class so that you can remember their function in bone turnover. These processes are regulated by many hormones and proteins, including parathyroid hormone and calcitriol, which act to stimulate osteoclastogenesis, freeing calcium into the serum. The body's last path of entry and or exit for calcium and phosphorus is through the kidneys. Recall that only ionized, that is free, calcium is filtered by the glomerulus. Close to 99% of this calcium is reabsorbed in the nephron, mostly passively in the proximal tubule or in the thick ascending loop of Henle. But the remainder of calcium is actively reabsorbed in the distal nephron under the influence of parathyroid hormone. It is this reabsorption that is responsible for physiologic calcium regulation as well as the dysregulation observed in some disease states such as hyperparathyroidism. Now, with phosphate, most of the filtered phosphate is reabsorbed by the proximal tubule, but this is blocked under the presence of PTH. The remaining calcium and phosphorus in the filtrate are excreted in the urine. At this point, you should be beginning to understand how parathyroid hormone affects renal handling of calcium and phosphorus very differently. This is essential because if PTH caused the levels to rise and fall in concert, the two would complex with each other in the urine, leading to no net change in calcium or phosphorus. 
there is additional effect from calcitriol to increase reabsorption of calcium and phosphorus. At this point, you should be able to go back and trace what may occur in the presence of hormone abnormalities. You can see now how PTH works to increase serum calcium through GI absorption and through bone resorption, but mainly through renal reabsorption. But PTH acts to decrease serum phosphorus. This occurs because the increased renal excretion of phosphorus is more significant than its effects on GI absorption and bone resorption. Think for a moment about what the serum and urine, calcium, and phosphorus would look like in a patient with overproduction of parathyroid hormone. Also think about what the effects on the bone might be. Finally, take a minute to think about what might happen if there is an inactivating mutation that causes the calcium-sensing receptor in the parathyroid gland to not detect elevated levels of calcium. Now, calcitriol, on the other hand, works to increase serum calcium and phosphorus, mainly through GI absorption, but also acting through bone resorption and renal reabsorption. Think now for a moment about a patient who is taking excessive calcitriol, or vitamin D, or who has a disease that is producing too much calcitriol. What would the serum in urine, calcium, and phosphorus look like in this patient? Alternatively, what if a person had zero intake of vitamin D and no sun exposure? In children, this can lead to rickets. In adults, it can lead to secondary hyperparathyroidism. What would the effects on bone be?